Um, so I'm going to talk today about two different insects that have been um, pretty important, you know, in the news and uh, important for Illinois. Um, again, I am the specialty crops entomologist at the University of Illinois. And so I work with all basically vegetable and fruit growers in the state. And both of these insects are relevant to um, actually to fruits really in the state. And so I should also mention here that this webinar is really gonna be sort of two parts. Um, and then the first part I will talk about spotted lanternfly and sort of invasive species. And in the second part, I'll talk about the periodical cicadas. And so these two things are, are pretty separate from each other. So I always like to start a discussion of spotted lanternfly with the discussion about just sort of invasive species and what they are and aren't. Um, and so, of course, they're kind of, they can be plants, animals, microbes, um, and they're really anything that comes to a new area, establishes and spreads, and causes harm. And so the harm thing is very important here. When we talk about non-native species, there are kind of a lot of things that may or may not be a problem, actually. Um, just because it is new to an area doesn't necessarily mean it's invasive or a problem. And so there's all kinds of ways that invasive species, should they be harmful, um, can uh, cause issues in their new home. Um, and so I've listed some here uh, where you're having sort of harm and elim elimination of native species, uh, crop damage, um, attacks to forests. And these are things that, you know, and disease transmission especially. Um, so these are all different ways that invasive species are a big problem. And of course, I've got, you know, a list over there on the right. This is a variety of invasive species that are actually significant here in Illinois. Um, and this list includes not only insects, but um, uh, fish, birds, and plants as well. Um, just sort of for your perusal. Um, and when we talk about spotted lanternfly specifically, uh, what we are worried about are these three things. So I've highlighted these. We're worried about this ha potential harm or elimination of native species. We're worried about crop damage. And we're possibly worried about attacks to forests. Um, that, that is maybe something that might happen. And of course, you know, spotted lanternfly, as I'm sure you know, has made a lot of news lately. So it's made news across the country. And I want to note that many of the news reports sort of focus on getting rid of it, uh, making sure that we can kill it and, you know, make sure that it doesn't spread. Um, and talking about essentially how many there are and how bad this problem is. Um, this one was one of my favorite headlines, um, kill it, uh, squash it, smash it, just get rid of it. And this one especially talks about the threat that spotted lanternflies might pose to a variety of crops, um, apples, grapes, hops, as well as native trees. And I think one of the things I'm going to try to convey in this webinar today is that although this worry about it is legitimate in some ways, I'm hoping that I will kind of assuage some of your fears about this insect and what it might do in its new home. So, you know, no discussion of invasive species uh, happens without us talking about where something comes from, what it's doing, uh, that sort of thing. So this particular insect is native to China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and it was actually discovered in the U.S. in 2014 in Pennsylvania. Um, it was confirmed in Illinois in 2023 with an, an infestation in Cook County. 
So spotted lanternfly feeds on plant sap. It depletes phloem and it can, it can weaken a tree as a result. Um, they also produce something called honeydew and honeydew is basically just sugar poop. And that leads to a buildup, can lead to a buildup of sooty mold on a plant. Um, now, I think this insect is quite pretty. Um, it's kind of a charismatic bug, um, but I understand why other people don't like it as much. Um, and I want to say that here, although spotted lanternfly, again, is capable of eating a variety of plants, at least here in the state of Illinois, and I think as it moves across um, into other areas, it's likely only going to be kind of a big problem for grape producers. Um, and there is some impact on other plants, but commercial grape growers will be contending with this more than probably anybody else will be. So I wanted to include this picture. You know, this is, you can have, you know, depletion of, um, of a plant by feeding by spotted lanternfly. And so while it is feeding on the plant sap and pooping sugar, uh, it does tend to also, it can attract sugar loving insects. So you can get a lot of wasps and things um, in the areas where spotted lanternflies are feeding, uh, which, you know, can be kind of a nuisance. Um, and then again, the sooty mold growing on the leaves can damage the leaves as well. Um, and one of the things that this can do on a larger scale is that if you are, again, if you're in a vineyard um, and there's a spotted lanternfly issue, if those grapevines, you're walking around the vineyard and it's very lovely and the grapevines are covered in um, spotted lanternflies, you also, again, can have more wasps and you know stinging insects around. And that can be an issue for agrotourism, um, for sure. So um, the question, you know, with things like this is when would we expect to see these guys? What does their life cycle look like? Um, that sort of thing. And I want to mention that the timings of the life cycle here that I have are based on the life cycle in Pennsylvania. Um, that's where spotted lanternfly has been studied the most. And so a lot of the information we have comes from there. And like I mentioned, spotted lanternfly is pretty new for Illinois. And so we don't have the exact life cycle timings here. But we might expect if we start up there in the left corner, um, you know, those eggs uh, hatch and you're going to get the first instars, the little guys. Um, first the third through April to July. Now with spotted lanternfly, the littlest nymphs are black with white spots. And as they get bigger, then they start to be that black with red on them and also white spots. And so you'll get those four thin stars, the bigger nymphs, July through August. And so this whole time they're feeding on plants, of course. Um, the, the adults will come out in late July and they'll, once they reach adulthood, then they'll start um, mating and laying eggs. Uh, the egg laying will happen from September through November, and then they overwinter in that stage. Now, I have um, I've seen, not here in Illinois, but another state um, where I took these pictures. Um, in November, I took pictures of those eggs. And one thing about spotted lanternfly is they do tend to lay their eggs sort of high up and far away from where you can reach. Um, but these uh, spotted lanternfly adults were actually active once it got warm enough all the way through November. And I should mention that in terms of sort of pest status, uh, the adults of this are, are the most destructive life stages to plants. Um, and here I wanna mention what spotted lanternfly likes the best. So they can consume a variety of plants, but their preferred food is actually something called tree of heaven. And <laughs> tree of heaven being the primary host is really interesting. So this is a non-native, it's considered an invasive species in the US as well. Some of the nicknames for it are stinking sumac, varnish tree and stink tree. 
because it has a strong offensive smell, mostly from its odors. Um, it has a really, really aggressive root system that can cause damage to pavement, sewers, and building foundations, and it can grow kind of anywhere. Um, and it tends to spring up after disturbances, such as extreme weather, um, and it really has advanced the spread of spotted lanternfly. Now, much like some other invasive species that we've had in the recent years, if spotted lanternfly only ate tree of heaven, spotted lanternfly would, cons would be considered a beneficial insect because this thing is invasive and it's a problem and we would consider it a biological control agent. Um, of course, it doesn't only eat tree of heaven and that's why we're talking about it. I also thought I would note here, and this is important, you know, for Illinois, um, that this map shows the areas that are suitable for spotted lanternfly, and, and that's in red, high suitability. And you can see that most of Illinois is considered very spot suitable for um, spotted lanternfly. I didn't do this, but if I took a map of um, tree of heaven distribution and I put it right on top of this map, they um, uh, would line up, would overlap quite well. And so uh, Illinois is highly suitable for spotted lantern flight because we have so much tree of heaven. However, that doesn't necessarily mean we will have them in crazy huge numbers. Um, this just means that because that plant is their preferred food source, uh, that they will, they would do well here. So you probably have heard, if you've heard anything about spotted lanternfly, that it's capable of eating a variety of plants. Um, and technically it does feed on more than 70 different plants. Um, we had a bit of a, um, uh, a moment recently because there was a paper that said that they could feed on pumpkin. But that was sort of, they were forced to feed on pumpkin. I don't think they're going to be a pumpkin problem. Um, but what I have listed here um, that, again, is another thing that Penn State Extension put together um, are the observations in eastern Pennsylvania that of where the actual spotted lanternflies were feeding. And the takeaway here is, again, there is a variety of things they're eating. But if you'll notice here, grape and tree of heaven are the only things that when observed, spotted lantern flies are on for all of their life stages. And so those are really the most important things um, uh, for this pest. The other one to note here is black walnut or butternut. Um, and so that's another that's another um, favorite of spotted lantern fly. So, you know, if you have a black walnut in your yard, uh, you may have more feeding from spotted lantern fly. The ones that I've actually seen in the wild um, when I was in Maryland, uh, in somebody's backyard on apple trees. Uh, so again, this, this doesn't, you know, sort of take care of everything that they'll be on, but it definitely does show you that there are a few things that this bug really likes um, and a variety of things that it can kind of be on. So the other thing is, of course, this is not to say that there is nothing here as far as pest status. Um, so you see the picture on the left is dieback of tree of heaven caused by spotted lantern fly feeding. This is a good thing, of course, because tree of heaven being a pest tree. Um, and I just want to note the picture on the right is a picture from the beginning of the invasion. And I would be very surprised if we get numbers like this in Illinois. I'm not saying we won't on the nuisance pest side, but often when these invasives come in, they come in in very high numbers at the very beginning. And as they move to new territory, their numbers don't maintain this level um, as, as they move along. Uh, and, you know, there's really little damage that they, or little evidence that they do damage to really mature trees, um, even in high numbers. And so, again, I think here in Illinois, our focus sort of writ large will be on protecting grape production, um, which is really the the area that, that we'd be worried about. And then dealing with the nuisance pest issue of um, 
uh, dealing with them should they get into, you know, your yards. And so I do want to talk a little bit about spotted lanternfly control, generally speaking, because I think, you know, sometimes when we have a new invasive, often the first question is, well, how do we control it? Um, what's the answer here? And there really is some good news when it comes to spotted lanternfly on that front. So again, you can absolutely see high numbers of spotted lanternfly. I would expect we will see some high numbers here. Um, but some of the control measures that we can use sort of, you know, that I've listed here. Um, the first one uh, being manual removal, uh, which <laughs> if you saw from the headlines that I put up before, you know, squishing them. But here I also mean removing tree of heaven from your yards. If you have tree of heaven growing in your yard or on your property, you want to get rid of it because it again is a... Um, as a pest tree, but the fewer of those we have around, the slower the spread of spotted lanternfly. Um, now the root system of this plant is really difficult to deal with. So it is actually really kind of hard once Tree of Heaven um, takes hold to get it out of off of your property. But that would be my first recommendation is to just make that plant go away as much as is possible. And I'm gonna talk a little about, you know, covering plants. And then, you know, there's insecticides available. Now, on the commercial side, you know, I'll, I give a variety of insecticide recommendations. When we're talking about homeowners, I still, um, and the general public, I still want to mention this bee box here. So whenever you spray an insecticide, should you choose to, um, uh, at your home, you need to be reading your insecticide labels and you need to be looking for this bee box. There's an entire um, sheet in the label that will contain this pollinator warning. If you see this, that means the insecticide you're about to use is very, very harmful for bees. And I would recommend against it if possible. Um, if you must use an insecticide that contains this icon in its insecticide label, then you must be very careful with it and make sure you're never spraying it on flowers, not spraying while bees are foraging, um, that sort of thing. And I think that's important because uh, there will be products that you could buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or any of those places that are probably going to carry this bee label. It's not just commercial insecticides that uh, we have to worry about with that. So that's my PSA on the bee label. So... Um, First thing is you can squish spotted lanternflies that you see. Um, at the end of this section of the talk, I will have a slide about how to let us know if you're seeing spotted lanternflies. I'd like you to take a picture first because we're still trying to, tr to track them, but you can squish them. That's our manual removal um, advice. The other thing is that, you know, within your yard, if you're very worried, let's say you have uh, you know, you're growing grapes in your backyard somehow, or you have some plants you're worried about and you're curious to see if you have them in your yard, you can make spotted lanternfly traps and just see, you know, um, uh, you know, be tracking them that way as well. Um, the commercially available ones are really probably designed more for, for, you know, a commercial grower of some sort, but there are ways for us to track these. There are actual traps um, to monitor for them and they're pretty effective as well. And so that's a really good that's really good news because often with insect pests don't actually have um, or we don't always have reliable traps. Now I mentioned this here. this is a study in grapes. Um, and the reason that I wanted to mention this is because the row covers putting mesh over your plant, actually works really well. It excludes the spotted lantern flies. Um, and it, in this ex instance, it reduced the spotted lantern flies on the grape vines by almost a hundred, uh, well, by almost 100%. So if you had, you know, a really susceptible plant in your yard, you could probably cover it to protect it from spotted lantern flies. But again, only if you're growing like a nice grapevine in your backyard, <laughs> um, or again, if you're a commercial grape grower, this is something that uh, is quite useful if you don't want to spray insecticides to deal with this pest. Exclusion is often a pretty good 
um, method for any small scale things. Uh, so again, backyard things, small scale plantings, a lot of times row covers uh, or other exclusion uh, is really useful. And there are, I should say, just generally speaking with this pest, I'm going to show you that some insecticide stuff, but there is, uh, there are goals to investigate a variety of non-chemical ways to deal with this pest as it moves across the landscape. But the majority of the research now has been really concentrated in um, uh, insecticides. Now, these are commercial insecticides. And really, all this is is to just let you know that these things are not actually all that hard to kill with commercial conventional insecticides. Um, and that's good news as something moves along. Because again, if we're worried about grapes, we want to make sure that we can take care of this problem if we need to through insecticide sprays. And so they there isn't doesn't appear to be much resistance yet. Um, and so a lot of our products work quite well um, in the field, which is which is great news. But again, this is all conventional production. And you'll notice here, and when I talk to commercial growers as well, you'll notice here that I put the bee box on two of these products as well. And so, you know, if I was recommending these insecticides, I would tell people to absolutely avoid those two, although they work well, but to use one of these other choices here, which are much uh, less harmful to bees. And so this thing, while busy, is sort of the tentative management options. And I show this to you just because there are lots of different ways that currently people are dealing with this, again, primarily in great production. Um, so, you know, you can scrape or destroy the eggs, again, this manual removal idea. And you can do that in your yard if you have an apple tree and a lanternfly lays eggs on there. You can manually remove the eggs. Um, there's these uh, hort horticultural oils, which are really do, don't harm bees, they don't harm other natural enemies, um, that's recommended. Again, there are traps that work, there are contact insecticides that work, and so yes, it's an invasive species, and yes, it is a problem if you're a great producer, and it may end up being, you know, a nuisance, but there are ways for us to deal with this currently, and so I do take that as um, uh, pretty good news for this new invasive to our state. And so again, sort of the take home is, yes, it's here. Um, it's probably not going to be nearly as bad as I think we thought it would when it first got to the United States. It may be a nuisance pest in your yard. Um, for sure in the fall, the numbers in the areas where it has established get pretty high. Um, and there are backyard trees it will feed on. Um, again, it's going to be a problem for grape production. And so for that part of agriculture, we will have to deal with this for sure. For everything else, it's probably just not going to be all that big of a deal. It'll just be another, you know, sort of insect that, that joins us. And so I wanted to put this here as well. So... Um, we do have an email to send information if you think you found one of these. Now, they're a really charismatic, distinctive insect. They kind of don't look all that much like anything else. Um, and so if you take a picture of one, we should be able to know whether or not it is, in fact, a spotted lanternfly. So lanternfly at illinois.edu. And in the... Um, uh, email, you can say, again, your location, your date, your time, and what you found it on, and then attach that photo. That way, we'll be able to have the information to, um, uh, to know where it's spreading and, you know, try to stay ahead of things should it start creating more problems as it uh, establishes here in Illinois. Um, and then again, there's sort of the strategic goal here through the USDA, about spotted lanternfly through 2028. And we really want to limit the advancement of it um, as we continue to learn more about it. Um, and, uh, and so that's, you know, what we're hoping to do. And with any invasive species, we're always hoping to limit its spread as much as is possible. 
So that is going to kind of do it for the spotted lanternfly part of this talk. And I'm going to move into uh, a talk about cicadas, which are in fact not invasive species. So I'm going to kind of switch gears um, uh, into cicadas here for a few minutes. So the, the title of this talk was about periodical cicadas. And I just want to mention here, um, uh, start the discussion with the annual cicadas that we see every year. So these cicadas come out every single year, um, and they have been in the ground for, for several years when they come out as adults. Um, but they tend not to sort of emerge in these really huge numbers um, because some of them come out every year, and then the next year, the next group of adults come out. They do some of the same type of damage that periodical cicadas do um, uh, with their egg-laying behavior, but because there's not nearly as many of them, we don't ever talk about them as being a, uh, as causing damage really to um, uh, trees in any measurable way. They're just around, they, they make noise, and most people recognize them uh, as residents um, that you recognize during the summer. So periodical cicadas, on the other hand, are a bit of a different beast. Um, and I want to mention that periodical cicadas as a group are only found in North America, only this part of the world. We have cicadas everywhere, but the only place that this particular behavior happens is actually um, uh, in, in this part of the world. And they're super cool animals, super long lived, and we tend to experience them only as adults um, in the brief time they're above ground to mate, but they are usually ground dwelling creatures. Um, and because they all come out at once, they're named by the years that they emerge, and these are called broods. Um, and so very rarely do we have simultaneous emergence of two broods of cicadas. It happens sometimes. The two that will be coming out this year in Illinois have not come out together since 1803. And they won't all come out together, these two groups, uh, for another about 200 years. So it's kind of cool that we're seeing these two groups come out of the ground together um, and a you know once in 200 year uh, little um, phenomenon. Oh, and I wanna mention here too, um, that their years are either 17 year cicadas. So the 17 years have been in the ground for 17 years or their 13 year cicadas, which again, they've been in the ground for 13 years when they all come out at once. And so when we expect to see these guys come out, um, they're actually really uh, specific as to when they start to emerge. So they live in the ground about seven to eight inches down and they will come out when that temperature of the ground at that level is 64 degrees Fahrenheit. They'll start to dig out. Um, we generally say this is late May to June. Of course, it's dependent on that that temperature, but because it's far enough underground, it it tends to be um, pretty close to that. Um, now, you would expect they will emerge earlier, further south, and they'll emerge later, further north. Um, so across the state, we expect to see periodical cicadas in the further south um, areas that they'll be, and then uh, earlier, and then um, later in the north. Um, and the nymphs will start to come out, they'll climb up and the adults will emerge. And they, the females will start laying eggs about seven to 10 days after they emerge. Uh, the females can lay lots and lots of eggs up to 400. And in order to lay the eggs, they slice into small branches of trees. And cicadas use about 75 different species of trees to lay their eggs in. So they are not specific to any type of tree. Um, and then once those nymphs um, hatch from their eggs, they will climb back down the tree and then they will go back into the soil for either set 13 or 17 years until they're ready to come out again as adults. And they tend to feed on um, tree roots uh, for you know the entirety of their, their life as nymphs then they're in the soil. So 
again, the damage, the, the one thing with periodical cicadas that, that we worry about is um, when they're laying their eggs in those branches, if you have a very, very young tree, um, they can do quite a bit of damage to a young tree. Um, in fact, so much so that depending on how many eggs are laid, they can even potentially kill a very young tree. Um, and you can see that in these pictures, you know, she's slicing into that branch um, with her egg laying uh, device and then laying the egg in there. And so that can really split that wood um, quite a bit. There isn't really a lot of evidence or any that they would do any damage to a fully mature tree. It's nothing that we really need to worry about. We mostly worry about these in this context with, with small trees. What's interesting to me, there's many things that are interesting to me about these guys, but particularly that there doesn't seem to be any evidence that the root feed, the, the root feeding does a lot to the tree. And that's interesting because again, these bugs are, you know, underground for 17 years, um, sucking on plant xylem. And there's some idea that, you know, nutrients that would otherwise otherwise go to the tree and fruit are of course being diverted to the cicadas, but there's never been any experimental evidence that says that this is really a huge problem for the trees, um, which I think is really interesting because again, we have a lot of cicadas under the ground um, feeding and you would probably never notice that until they come out and then do this damage with their egg laying. Um, and so when you're watching out for the cicadas this year and you're wondering if your area has them, um, if you can go see them, hear them, all that kind of good stuff, um, you listen for the singing. Um, our, our regular cicadas are a little bit later in the year. Um, and so these guys, the males are noted earlier than the females and they'll be singing to um, attract the females. And if you get enough of them together, they can be 90 to 100 decibels. It can be really loud if there's a bunch of them. Um, and so then again, as I noted, when the females come out, then you've got some time before they start laying eggs. Um, and the one thing that I will say is if you have mature trees in your yard, then you don't need to worry about these at all. Uh, if you have any brand new trees that you've planted, or even ones that maybe you planted last year, uh, a good way to deal with these is to just put a net around the tree. Um, if you can get netting around a small tree um, and sort of tie it at the at the uh, trunk, that's a good way to go. Um, I I would not probably recommend that you know homeowners as much are worrying about spraying for these guys. Um, now, if you're an orchard owner, uh, I do have recommendations for people who um, have commercial uh, plantings, for sure. There are definitely recommendations for um, how to deal with that, absolutely. But when it comes to homeowners and things, um, uh, there's, you know, sort of um, netting is a way to go. If you were thinking of planting a new tree this spring and you have not already purchased it, I would recommend you wait. Um, we won't have this level of cicadas uh, next year. Um, so if you can hold off, that would be great. Um, oh. That map got a little messed up for us. Um, so sorry about that. Let's see. Okay, so um, here in Illinois, um, what we expect to see and where we might expect to see our broods. Um, so I have highlighted here, I, I modified this from some um, uh, verified sources of where these cicadas came out the last time. So where you see these red dots, this is the Northern Illinois brood. This is our 17 year cicada that will be coming out this year. Um, the uh, purple one is the Great Southern brood and that's our 13 year cicada. These two are both coming out this year. Now, I will say that just if there's not, you know, a dot or a triangle in your area, it doesn't necessarily mean there won't be cicadas, but these are the reliable sources and evidence from the last time these ones came out. 
Now, what I included here is I included the Mississippi Valley brood as well, what you see in yellow. Now, this one is a little different because this one is actually a cicada brood that is supposed to be coming out in 2028. But with periodical cicadas, you sometimes get ones that are called stragglers, which are some set of cicadas that come out on off years. And this particular one is predicted to maybe have a few come out in 2024. And so I've included it because uh, members of this brood are in areas where our two 2024 broods are not coming or are not coming out, or at least not mapped to be. Um, and so I just want to make a note that we may see cicadas in areas that uh, may not fall into where the two broods we know are coming out will be found uh, this year. So sort of a take home here is that, you know, for these two broods, 2024 is for sure a once in a lifetime. Um, again, two broods don't come out all that often in the same years anyway. But certainly these two we haven't seen since before Illinois was a state come out in the same year. You want to protect your small trees from damage. Go out and look and see if you have cicadas. Everybody's not going to have cicadas. They're not going to be in every single yard. Um, so you can listen for them and scout for them before you, you know, worry too much about making sure that you're, you know, protecting things. If you have mature trees in your yard, you're fine. Um, they won't, they won't be a problem. And they don't really feed on anything herbaceous. Uh, if you have things like blueberries, um, they may feed, they may um, lay their eggs in those. But, you know, just going outside and seeing sort of what's going on. Um, as homeowners, uh, not in commercial production, I generally would not recommend that you spray any insecticides. But I will say, because they spend so much time underground, the insecticides we have for them actually work quite well. Um, it might get a bit loud as much as you can. Just appreciate these sort of weird creatures that we don't really have anywhere else on the planet and enjoy your uh, late spring, early summer of cicadas. Um, and so with that, uh, I just want to put this up here. My lab has an Instagram. Um, there's my contact information. I also have a lab website that we try to post things on if you want to get a hold of me. Um, have any questions? I'm hoping to, you know, do some activities around periodical cicadas uh, as the as the spring wears on because it really is a very cool phenomenon uh, for us entomologists. We're all very excited. Um, and then I uh, I will probably take any questions that you have. So please provide feedback. Um, I will follow up with this link in an email, but I just put it in the chat box so you could scan this with your smart device and provide feedback. So that's always helpful to us. Uh, but great job today.